good. Well, we have Chris Harris back, and uh, oh, wow. Uh, I, I like the uh, term you use, I call the F, F-U-K-U facts. <laughs> you could actually make a little minor uh, slur on that, and you, it would sound pretty gross. But the fact is there's a YouTube article you have, and we'll be posting up the link. Uh, this particular article is by Susan uh, Duclos. Uh, while governments across the globe, with the help of the mainstream, continue to lie and mislead, information is out there, documented and admitted horrifying. In fact, as the title states, the, the data is too horrifying to believe, and yet it is true. For Fukushima, 11 facts about the ongoing Fukushima nuclear disaster are too horrifying to believe. Uh, a sheep no more. And uh, you've listed them here. I want you to go through them uh, fact by fact. Do you have it in front of you, uh, Chris, or do you want me to read yeah. it? Hey, hey, before you begin, though, I want you to scroll right down to the last sentence of the article and, and read the, that last sentence. Uh, the, la- the last sentence of the article here is, uh, yeah. it says, uh, These governments, it starts with, and mainstream media are directly complicit in the murder of citizens. In the video below, Dr. Deagle discusses the multiple pathways to catastrophe from Fukushima that are still all active. When I, when I, when I saw that, like, my jaw dropped. Guess what? <laughs> it was our interview from last week. I just oh, very good. That. Very good. Well, that was, that I, I'm, was I'm working on. I'm working hard to combine our emails back and forth with my documentation, the nuclear physics, the engineering physics of the nuclear reactors, the remediation technologies, and the personal protection that needs to be done, and the cleanup of this mess that's literally killing the Pacific Ocean. And by the way, it connects to all the oceans of the Earth. We don't realize, uh, the population doesn't realize because they can't taste or smell radiation, but they're bioaccumulating. And uh, I'll give you an example. One of my neighbors is dying now of uh, cancer. And it's the kind of cancer, by the way, cesium-137 concentrates in the breast. So, you know, they have the Susan Coleman run for the, the cure and the pink ribbons everywhere, including on the NFL players and NBA, et cetera. Well, guess what? Because women have not protested this, they're going to be dying by the millions due to cesium-137 concentrating in every glandular tissue, especially breast tissue. And people need to realize what's going on now is too horrifying to believe that within 10 to 15 years, if this continues, Human beings won't be able to reproduce, period. We're talking about human beings will not be able to reproduce. I'm repeating that so they get it. When I'm not saying this is a maybe, in fact, I'm waiting for a confirmation from the Academy of Environmental Medicine to do the keynote lecture on Fukushima to the Academy this coming October in in, uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico, at the annual meeting. What people need to understand is the amount of radiation being released. And By the way, this is just a foreshock. The real danger is a major quake that will not just hit Fukushima, but at least half a dozen other major radioactive sites where they almost lost control just from the earthquake, let alone the tsunami. Just the earthquake was enough to make a lot of other reactors get serious damage done, including OI. And what I see coming is major quakes, which will totally destroy Fukushima, which is a nuclear waste site, where they will have a massive release of radiation, a massive... Uh, open sore to the Pacific Ocean, a massive burst of of nuclear uh, criticality that will cause a massive air burst of radiation and pyrophoric fires as these cooling pools empty out and then the isotopes and the cooling pool fuel rod assembly pellets actually go on fire. So we're going to have a nuclear fire, we're going to have major radiation release, and we're going to have other reactors in northern Japan go crazy because this Abe government, Um Shinrikyo death cult, are actually determined to reactivate all 55 sites around Japan. And they had an offer from an American supplier of gas from the Bakken to convert all the reactors to, to liquefied natural gas. And our government and Obama blocked it. Obama, the, uh, I call him Obama, blocked it. I mean, I can't believe that this stuff is happening. But it is. So let, let's go through this list here. We want to go through the first. 1,331 oh. used fuel rods need to be removed from Fukushima, and they must be removed manually, which could potentially lead to a nuclear chain reaction. Number two, the amount of cesium-137 in those rods <clears throat> 14,000 times, 14, times greater than what was released when the U.S. dropped a bomb on Hiroshima. Number three, at least 300 tons of radioactive water is being poured in the Pacific Ocean each day. Actually, revise that, please. It's at least 1,000 tons. and has been since the earthquake and tsunami crippled Japan. Number four, Three giga becquerels of cesium-137 are flowing in the port of Fukushima Daiichi every single day. Number five, 20 to 30 trillion becquerels of radioactive tritium have flowed in the Pacific Ocean since Fukushima. By the way, it causes what's called a 
uh, or shift in the codons of DNA, so it disrupts the normal reproduction of the uh, double helix of DNA in all living things. Number six, Canadian fish are bleeding from, uh, bleeding from eyeballs, faces, fins, and tails. Number seven, dozens of former sailors and Marines are suing with the claim that they have radiation sickness as a result of serving on the USS naval ship near Fukushima. That includes the Reagan. And by the way, I was not involved in that in the presentation last weekend because no one asked me to review the protocols for treatment. They were raising money for, quote, care. What kind of care? Uh, my protocols for radiation remediation are the most advanced in the world, and no one asked me, including that panel, about my number one technical answers to solve the technical problems, or number two, the radiation reduction and remediation. For example, every one of these workers, every one of the citizens of northern Japan, should have had a bank bone marrow. Bank your bone marrow so that when you do crash, we can at least multiply your bone marrow cells and give them back to you. Nobody's talking about a bone marrow bank, are they? Uh, this is really sickening, and when I get all these so-called pseudo-experts out there, including Dr. Aftley and others, who pretend that they can just shunt the eagle aside, I don't appreciate that. And I want people to know that I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. I want people to understand I'm asking tough questions, and I'm going to separate the knuckleheads from the people who really want to do something for these sailors. And I do my consults free. I don't charge. They don't need any money. And we'll make special deals for them for the supplements. But I want to tell them you need proper radiation testing. There's a device, for example, the University of Utah made it a battleship steel before the nuclear testing above ground. They can actually measure the total body burden of isotopes by measuring uh, the, uh, the uh, neutron flux and the gamma burst from their cells because of the continued embedded isotopes in their body. You can get an actual number. And if you don't have these numbers, how do you tell if you detox somebody? You don't. So that's real science. No one's talked about this. Number eight, the northern hemisphere will be affected for decades. No, no, forget decades. Add a bunch of zeros. Uh, plutonium half-life, 24,900 years. Uranium half-life, 4.5 billion years, with a B. Number nine, there are estimates that Fukushima originally contained 17, uh, 60 tons of nuclear material. No, the, the actual estimate of all of the sites, including the common cooling pool, reactors, one, two, three, four, five, and six, et cetera, is probably closer to 4,000 tons plus. 4,000 tons. Uh, number 10, it's estimated the entire Pacific Ocean will soon have cesium five to ten times higher than what during the era of heavy atomic bomb testing the Pacific many decades ago. Uh, no, it's going to have a lot higher than that. In fact, the amount of material, it's not a graphite reactor like the reactor at Chernobyl <coughs> or the reactor that, that had trouble with Three Mile Island when they never lost containment. We're dealing with an open sore with basically China syndrome of three different reactors, and the high probability, if the site goes completely gone, that the reactors four, five, and six that are still fueled, and the common cooling pool and cooling pool number four will go up in a power fork fire and a nuclear explosion with criticality. Number 11, it could take up to 40 years for the cleanup from Fukushima. Uh, we don't have 40 years. If there's 40 years, there's no more humanity, period. Plus, during that time, this is a statistical fact. The chances of a large earthquake, 7 plus, that will destroy Fukushima and most of the reactors of Japan is literally somewhere around 60 to 70 percent the next five years. So in the next five years, you get about a 60 to 70 percent chance that you have an earthquake large enough to completely turn the area of Fukushima into mush, nuclear mush, and cause most of the other reactors, just with an earthquake or even a tsunami, to lose containment, lose backup power, and go China syndrome. Okay, so we don't have 40 years. Forget that. And when I heard the statement by uh, Arne Gunderson of we have 100 years, we don't have 100 years. If we don't fix this thing up now, five years from now, the, non, the northern hemisphere will be so radioactive that in, within 10 years, with the amount of radiation being released, especially if a big earthquake strikes, any woman attempting to get pregnant will be considered foolhardy. That's how serious this is back in a moment. The, the cleanup is being operated by Roka, Fukushima Zoe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and we're back with uh, Chris Harris. Chris, uh, you know, we use my hyperbole to explain just how bad the situation is. We don't see the Obama doing anything. We don't see the IAEA doing anything. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the current commissioner, is useless compared to JASCO, who was trying to do something. No one's asking tough questions. Even the so-called celebrity scientists, when they spin it, they don't actually say how really bad it is. They always couch it. Even Ernie Gunderson couches it always and tempers it down. 
Chris Bosby the same. They actually make statements out of their area of expertise, which I find disturbing. And even Helen Caldicott says we're farther in the southern hemisphere. We're going to be okay. No, you won't be right, Helen, because those oceans are all connected. And secondly, the air masses carry uh, radioactive waste at high atmosphere, tropospheric, trans-equatorial currents at the rate of 300 times the flow of the Amazon rainforest every day. So we already know the ocean currents are carrying massive radiation to the east coast of Australia, to the ocean waters off the west coast of New Zealand. And uh, you're not safe down there. Yes, it'll peak later. Yes, and most of the northern hemisphere will be dead radioactive wasteland by the time you guys are still just getting into trouble. But you're not going to be spared. And I want people to understand this. This is also a, a warning for the Most High God to say, stop all older nuclear technology. He's going to move to more advanced technology and better systems so if, of not water storage but casks and move those damn casks away from the reactor sites so you're not sitting with 60 years of radioactive waste on sites that are in liquid containers or cooling pools. This is pure insanity. And the same thing goes with San Onofre just up the road here, 12 miles from where I live in Southern California. Luckily, we haven't had any releases because my radiation detector sitting in my bedroom tells me things are okay, but it's gradually snuck back up just a little bit in radiation, but nowhere near as high as it was last spring. We had periods of six, seven, eight weeks where it was up to five times background. It wasn't from San Onofre. It was from Japan. But <clears throat> they're going to have more accidents. They're getting over the easy fuel rod assembly uh, bundles being pulled. The more difficult ones are coming up next. And they had a crane accident. I want you to tell us about the crane accident, which shows you how human error can really blow everything to pieces. What happened over the last few days, uh, Chris? Okay, well, they're up to, uh, they only have one, they only have 1,005 fuel assemblies left in Unit 4 spent fuel pool to removal. Uh, thank you to simplyinfo.org for alerting me to this one. Uh, yesterday, the uh, crane that removed the fuel from Unit 4 had a little malfunction where they were running the crane with the, with the this sounds funny, with the parking brake on, but they, they damaged the motor on that plane. It's a little more significant than it sounds and because it means a few things. Um, the plane is out of service now. You won't be moving any more fuel for perhaps a week or so. Number two, uh, it means that they're getting sloppy in their operation. This is a coordination type of a failure and it's an operator failure. This is something I'm fully qualified in talking about. Uh, things get a little complicated. The people are getting fired. The people have lack of experience and they start making mistakes. Those are the mistakes that I've been talking about that will amplify uh, a bad situation. And what I'm looking for is that, though I'm hoping it doesn't happen, that a mistake is made and a cask is dropped in the spent fuel pool, just puncturing right through the floor of the spent fuel pool. So these are the little mistakes that add up over a period of time. And uh, the effects of these are, uh, well, if anybody's done any probable, uh, probabilistic risk assessment, Human factors plays a, a huge part. You know, you always talk about um, uh, any kind of a disaster. A train der derailing in New York not too long ago. The operator fell asleep at the switch, you know, or, or on the train. Things like that. These are, this is exactly what I'm talking about. These people are under a lot of pressure. As you had brought up, they're under um, uh, pretty tough, severe environmental uh, pressures, such as uh, radiation areas. They take them a very long time to suit up. To get into uh, respirators, as soon as anybody's ever worked in a respirator, the first thing that happens when you put one on is a bead of sweat forms on the end of your nose and you can't knock it off and it's annoying as heck. I mean, these people are working in this situation and there's a, uh, a whole slew of procedures that they have to follow to do it exactly right. Mistakes are going to happen now and then. This one is a pure example of one mistake that damaged the equipment that you use to safely move fuel. So, you know, then no. I, thank, I also sent you the NHK version of the same article confirming it. Okay. So now, you got I'm it. going to ask you a, a different kind of question. You also consulted recently, and this is this is your radio name, Chris Harris, but you have another name. It's your real name. But you actually consulted with Capco in Korea, which has virtually identical type old-style reactors. A lot of those old-style right. Mark I reactors, et cetera, or in America, about a quarter of 104 reactor sites. Around the world, what are they doing in countries like France, Switzerland, Rosatom for Russia, where they now have got apparently eight new customers that are going to be delivering reactors over the next five years. Eight reactors are going to build for South Africa. 
I mean, this, this nuclear proliferation with older technology is dangerous and stupid and also tends to bring breeder reactors that supply nuclear material that could be used for making nuclear weapons. Uh, not a smart move by humanity to do this kind of stupid stuff. Um, the safety with extreme weather, earthquakes, volcanoes, tsunamis like the Cumbra Viejo off the Azores, most of our reactors sit on literally the coastal America coast. So one of the bad side effects, even with a tiny tsunami, the one that's likely to happen after Cumbra Viejo falls is going to be about 800 feet high, which means it'll swamp up to between 100 and 300 miles inland because most of the coastal United States, including around Washington, D.C., is only up to 300 feet above sea level, which means it's going to move a long way in except in mountainous areas, say North Carolina. Uh, all these reactors are going to go. There are hundreds of reactors in dozens of reactor sites. And uh, that's not just there. It's in France along the coast. It's in Britain along the coast. It's, you know, I just don't understand what people don't understand. The extreme weather and the chances of tsunamis now are dramatically increasing. Uh, and we should have learned a lesson that we need to move to better technology, either more advanced fusion-type fusion reactors, better ways of putting material into casks and getting them off-site, and better ways of shipping it safely in double-hauled ships to a permanent storage facility that could be international. But we don't do anything right. I mean, nothing that is logical is going on. The Japanese, to save their economy, have actually turned on the reactor. So what's happening in a kind of round robin around the world for Switzerland, France, these other countries, are what are they doing? What are we doing here in America? What's the new director of the NRC doing to say they're going to fix this problem so that whether we have a power blackout because we go to war with Syria and Iran and they're you know, their cybernetic force hits their power grid, and we have now a bunch of blackouts of all our nuclear reactor backup power, and now we're going hot with a bunch of reactors that blow their top. That could happen tomorrow if the Israelis go crazy and decide to bomb Iran. And so we're not ready for any of this, are we? Uh, not really. And uh, while you asked the question about the Koreans, not only had the rude awakening when they looked at and studied the type of event that could happen there, uh, I'd like to say that they were caught with their pants down, but actually they weren't even wearing any pants when they realized it, that uh, how bad it really could be there. So that's uh, what's the way I could put it. So they are trying to uh, come up with solutions to the problems, and they're, they're not cheap solutions. That's the other problem, too. I mean, it's hard to come up with a one-solution-fits-all type of a uh, scenario. That's what everyone is trying to do. That's the biggest fault I have, even what, what we're doing in the United States. We're coming up with one solution that would fit every single scenario, and I, I, it's not really feasible to do that. Although uh, a lot of uh, hats are hanging on uh, portable equipment being transported across damaged area in the nick of time, uh, that it, I don't think it's enough. I think we need to do some more in that work in that area. And what I'm trying to say is that sometimes. Sometimes you just aren't going to make it, so we don't have any uh, plans or contingencies, we call them mitigation strategies, for halting or stopping or containing a mess after everything else all failed. And that, that shouldn't be ignored because, as we see in Fukushima, that is, that is really what's happening. Everything failed, and now there's no way to contain the mess. So uh, now, of course, the, you know, years after the fact, we're talking about ice dams and moats and and wells that I mean, it's, 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 or, like uh, a, you know. it's like a, a sick bunch of set designers on a Hollywood movie screen that the set's not even going to survive making the full movie. Yeah. Oh. I mean, that's the only uh, analogy I can make to this is that, uh, and it turns out, by the way, that all the companies under the umbrella called TEPCO are all American. So it's American CEOs that are actually doing this insanity. Wow. That's pretty hard to believe, but it's true. <clears throat> the nightmare of, of, basically, I think I think Fukushima in some ways is a blessing because it's telling the Earth, no more nuclear wars for you, planet Earth. No more bad nuclear technology. you got to move to more advanced, safer, or nuclear fusion to have energy that doesn't consume oxygen because peak oxygen is an issue this century. Thank you, Chris Harris. Give me a call if there's any major updates. Again, hour two tonight on the Rents Network. 